Thank you for playing for us, Mike. We really appreciate that. Well, welcome to the uh, New Look Church Service for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Whangarei. And uh, for you, those of you joining us at home, it is fantastic to uh, be with you in this manner and to be using technology in this style. And uh, we pray that you will be just as blessed right where you are as when you come to church every Sabbath and fellowship in person. Uh, the current crisis we're in, the current situation will pass. We will resume our in-person fellowship, but until then, we will endeavor to do everything we can to make sure that we're ministering the word, sharing the gospel, connecting with you, and technology is a great boon to be able to do that, a tremendous asset in our hands. And so do be sure to check in regularly, even during the week, uh, on our Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, Facebook page for Whangarei, uh, as well as YouTube and, and so on and so forth. We will, be, we will be communicating, we will be sharing, we will be studying staying in touch and ministering the word through that platform throughout the week. So not only will we have the live stream, but uh, staying in contact. And we want to engage in discussion. We want you to share with us. So please, uh, please join us in that community experience. Today, what we're going to do is focus on the Word. We're going to be sharing a little bit uh, from the Gospels, uh, from the book of Psalms. We're starting in Psalm 34 right now, and I invite you simply to bow your head for a word of prayer as we begin. Father God, today we are living in unprecedented times. We know this. We uh, are also blessed that in these times we have these technologies. And right now, across this town of Whangarei and beyond its borders, people are tuning in, and um, even in other countries, to be able to hear your word presented, to find a message of comfort and hope. And uh, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will come down upon every person in every location and bring this word that we talk about here alive. May it touch, may it transform, may it be the balm of grace that is for us life itself. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a few situations in history, and I'm sure that you can think of some of them, that it's like a, it's like a, a moment of time has been frozen in your memory. For me, and I've mentioned it before in other circumstances, but for me, the day that 9-11 happened in the United States, I know exactly where I was, who I got the phone call from, when I tuned into television to watch that event that forever changed global travel and forever changed the world around us. There have been other marked events like that, and I think that perhaps this week, around the world, it has been such an event. I doubt that our society will ever return to exactly what it was before. That doesn't mean it can't be just as good or better, but I don't think that we will return in the light of this pandemic that's gone across the world and the, the strong measures that have been taken to prevent its spread and slow it down. I doubt that we will ever return economically, culturally, socially to what we were before. And so what does the Word of God have to say in circumstances like this? Well, the Word of God is very relevant. Of course, not by a word search, not by COVID-19 or coronavirus or any particular word like that. But in principle, the Word of God is timeless, it's ageless, and it speaks to people in all circumstances of life. You see, fundamentally, the situation may change from generation to generation, but the issue of the human heart remains constant. The things we struggle with, the things that previous generations have struggled struggled with. The situation may be different, but the, uh, the aspects of fear, the aspects of independence, the temptation to take matters into our own hands, to do things in our own way, the rebellious streak that has arisen within our hearts at times, whatever it might be arousing in you, a particular situation, you need to know that the uniqueness of the situation doesn't make the Word of God irrelevant, because the Word of God is about the Lord, through His Spirit, through His counsel, addressing the human heart. Your heart is addressed by Scripture today in this age and in this situation. We've gone into stores and we have seen uh, supermarket shelves emptied. And for the life of me, the one that no one's been able to explain to me yet is the run on toilet paper. I mean, like, really, I get the baked beans and I get the pasta, but I'm not sure I understand the toilet paper one just yet. But nevertheless, these are the crazy things that we do in times of desperation. I think it's been very interesting to me as I've watched this whole thing unfold around the world, not so much the pandemic itself, but the, human, the response of human nature, 
this self-preservationist mode we go into, this desire to, to, to take care of ourselves, the fear and the anxiety that takes hold of us, these are the things that Scripture speaks to loud and clear. Psalm 34 is an amazing psalm, which I happened to read with my family last night as we were spending time in the Word when the Sabbath hours began. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There's a spirit that the psalmist is speaking of here. This, there's a focus for the believer that transcends the circumstances of the world. Now, David, who writes this, was not a man who was immune from situations of fear, situations of suffering, situ situations of death or imminent death, of threat to his life. He wasn't a man that was immune to sin. We know his sordid story. And yet he's writing here about this, this something that transcends the circumstances. That something is the same thing available to us today, the same thing available to you today. It's this idea that we see beyond what's going on now to the greater picture. We look heavenward. We look upward. We see a God who is present in the midst of trouble, a God who will deliver us out of trouble, a God who understands our circumstances, our pain, our suffering, and our fears and our anxieties. And because of that, he's able to say crazy things like, through it all, no matter what, my, his praise will be on my lips. I, uh, lips. I will magnify the Lord before the world. That is a focus, that is a commitment, that is a spiritual strength that transcends the moment of insecurity. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. From all my fears. I, I want you to think about this concept today of deliverance. I want you to think about it as much bigger than the circumstances we pray over. Because I think very often we're praying for deliverance from a particular thing, a particular moment in time, a particular struggle. Maybe it's, maybe it's this virus thing, or maybe it's a financial, the financial economic implosion that's happening or whatever. I want you to notice what he says here. I sought the Lord and he answered me, delivered me from all my fears. I think he's talking about more than circumstances. I think he's talking about more than the fact that every time he came up against something bad in the world, God miraculously intervened to get him out of that thing because we know that David suffered loss and he was in circumstances and there were times when he got hurt and those around him got hurt and that's often what happens in this world. You see, the Christian security isn't that God's promise is that out of every particular situation, he will save you unscathed. Now you're thinking, Adrian, that's not very comforting right now. But, but, but bear with me here. Life does not hold true to that. There are times he does intervene. He, there, there's nothing wrong with praying for deliverance from a circumstance. I encourage you to do that. But I want you to see that deliverance is bigger than the circumstances we find ourselves in. Deliverance, he says here, out of all my fears. I want you to go back in history with me to a time of persecution, to a time that we call the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. I want you, if you know the story, to recall the many events where Christians were thrown in jail, where Christians were put to death, where they were, where they were killed in some very horrible ways. Not only, not only in the Dark Ages, but right back to the times of the early church. In every age around the world today even, there's persecution happening. And I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you that while it's okay to pray for deliverance from circumstances, I encourage you to do that because there are times when God does open the prison doors like he did with Peter and bring him out miraculously. There are times when, when he shakes the earth and the, and, the, and the gates swing open and the shackles fall off the hands like with, with Paul and, and, and others. You know, There are times when God does intervene miraculously in circumstances. But I want you to take a view of Scripture that deliverance, that God will always work in every circumstance within your heart to do so much more than deliver from the circumstance only. Adopt a wider perspective in your prayer life, in your expectations of God. God's deliverance is also about setting us free from ourselves. 
setting us free from our selfish, self-preservationistic instincts, setting us free because we are no longer afraid, because we have found our security and our rest and our comfort in Him, whether we live or whether we die, whether in health or whether in sickness, whether in wealth or whether in poverty, whether in happiness or whether in sadness, whether with the bonds of friendship or socially isolated or even facing the loss that death brings. You see, deliverance is much more than circumstantial. Deliverance is an experience where you are set free from being a slave to this world, set free from the corruption of our own hearts, set free from the fears that drive us to the craziest of, of, of manners of taking things into our own hands. You see, I want you to notice what he says here. I sought the Lord and he answered me. How did he answer him? He delivered me from all my fears. And I would suggest that today in this day and age and in many other circumstances and in many other times, it's that fear, that fear that we need deliverance from. The opposite of fear is finding our security and our trust and the assurance of a glorious future. Whether life down here is short or long, there is more beyond. There is something better beyond. There is the presence of Christ now, today, and there is something beyond as well. This isn't all there is. So if you're building your life on the things of this world, the ambitions of this world, you've missed the boat. If you're building your hopes on the success of this world, circumstances like we find ourselves in today and many others before them are reminders, harbingers, uh, uh, messages of mercy from the Lord to say to us, hey, do not count on this world. Do not invest everything you have in this world. Do not place your hopes and your dreams in the circumstances of this world, the ambitions of this world, even the relationships of this world. You need something beyond that. And when you find that something in God, when you find your security in the Creator, in the Redeemer, when you, when you have that, you find deliverance from your fears. It says here, they looked to Him and were radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear Him and rescues them. And again, I want you to read that in the context of a much bigger rescue than the rescue from circumstances. Because even if you, even if you cast the darkest pall of motivation on what's going on in our world or on, on the loss that we face in death, even if you say that the devil has killed us, that, that what has happened is that the devil has gained a victory in this life, even if you put the darkest hue on the, on, on, on the circumstances around us, even if you do that, I want you to know that death isn't a victory. Jesus has secured a victory of eternal life. The devil has no victory, even if he is the one who actively puts you to death and you die. In Christ, eternal life is secure. In him, your redemption is guaranteed. There is no victory for Satan. Even if there is sleep for you, there is no victory for Satan. Because you have gained the victory in Jesus. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And that's what you and I need in an age of insecurity. We need to make sure that we are finding our refuge in the right place. There are many, a thousand other false refuges. It's a form of the idolatry of our hearts to find refuge in some other thing other than God. Find your refuge in him. Fear the Lord, all you his saints. For to those who fear him, there is no want. Yes, young lions lack and suffer hunger. They, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And it goes on to describe those who live in covenant with him. In verse 15, it says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut them off, the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You see, being in relationship with Jesus is not a free pass to no afflictions. In fact, Scripture is quite blatant about this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. In verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants 
and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. You see, I'm trying to paint a picture for you today of a very present God in the midst of trouble. A God to whom you can turn. A God that will hear and anticipates the fears of insecurity, the fears of your heart, who's not disgusted, who does not turn away from you when you struggle. But this is the God that we find our refuge in. We flee towards Him like a, like a child running towards the arms of their father. Yesterday when I got home, we've got a an almost four-year-old who, for some reason, walked around the back of the house in the bright, brightness of day. It wasn't dark or nighttime, and he'd been a bit upset before. I don't know what, you know, he's, he's a bit clingy, and he walked around the side of the house, and he came back yelling and screaming, monster, monster, and he was in tears and came straight to his father who picked him up and carried him to go and confront the monster around the back. You see, that's the reality of our standing with Jesus. We flee towards him. He is the God who is present with us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't abandon us. That's the promise of the Gospel Commission at the end of Matthew 28. Behold, I am with you to the end of the age, through pestilence, through earthquake, through famine, through last day events, through trials of whatever nature, whatever makes you weak at the knees, the Lord is present with you in those things. Flee towards him. Make him your refuge and your strength. His ear is open to the cry of his children. He wants to console. He wants to step in. He wants to be your deliverer. He wants to set you free, first of all, from the fears and the anxieties of your own heart. He wants you to know the peace that transcends understanding and maybe also the circumstances of this life in some miraculous intervention, some protective way. But regardless of that latter, you can know Redemption and salvation and refuge and peace and rest and all that good stuff, not least of which is hope, in the midst of challenge. In Acts chapter 8, it tells of a time when the church entered an era of persecution. It's the story of the scattering of the believers in the light of Stephen, the first one of the first Christian deacons who was stoned to death at the hands of the Sanhedrin, right? It says in verse 1 of chapter 8, Saul was one of the witnesses. He agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church, verse 4, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. The crowds listened intently, etc., etc., etc. I want you to understand this, that today I do not see what's going on in the world, even with the closure of churches, as an act of persecution. It is not that. Wherever you hear a conspiracy theory, wherever you have an interpretation that, that perhaps these measures are being taken as a part of last day events to close it down, no, 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 this is not that at all. What we've got here today is a measure taken for the well-being of society. And as a church family, we get to participate in that by preventing and contributing to the prevent of the spread of this plague. Nevertheless, the church is not under fire. This thing that's happening does not have a religious bent to it, does not have a religious persecution element to it. So in that sense, what we're living through today is quite different to, to the story of Acts chapter 8. Nevertheless, even if it was that, even if it was a situation of persecution, I want you to understand this. Every crisis is an opportunity. Every crisis is an opportunity. The believers in the book of Acts were so fixated on Jesus that though they were persecuted, though they were scattered, driven out of their homes, out of their comfort zones, they had to learn to do things new. They had to establish new networks, go to new places just to survive. They were essentially refugees from their homes. That despite that terrible, dire circumstance that none of us would want to live through, despite the inconvenience of it, they took Jesus with them. They took the message of hope with them. Everyone they came into contact with was an opportunity to share the gospel. It was like God said, I need to do something or at least permit the devil's outworkings in such a way that it changes the game, that it motivates, that it drives the church of God out of its comfort zone. So I want to ask you, in this time, 
while we're taking refuge in Christ, while we are solidifying our own experience with Him, while we're finding comfort in Him, who in your circle of friends needs that message? Who can you reach across to using telephonic technology or, or video conferencing or, 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 or a message, a text message, something that heretofore, before this age, wasn't available, but today, even when we're physical distancing ourselves, and as a note, you will see that in our latest government announcement last yesterday, they've changed the terminology from social distancing to physical distancing because I think there's a very valuable change in message there. We are not socially distancing ourselves. We're not, we're not working against relationships, but we are, because of the nature of infection, in, in, um, entertaining physical distance. So in this age of physical distancing, in the season, how can you socially press in? How can you establish relationships? How can you bridge the gulf? And as someone, uh, as someone I deeply respect said, be a dealer of hope. Be a dealer of hope in these dire situations where people are filled with fear and, and trepidation. You see, the church of God was pushed to do something different by circumstances. Circumstances that were terrible, but they were pushed to do something different. I want to suggest to you that you're in exactly the same situation. The motivation might be different. We're not being persecuted. We're, the attempt isn't to shut down the church. But how can you do something in the midst of this physical distancing to still be an ambassador for the kingdom of God, to still reach across the gulf, to deal hope to someone, to share the message of faith with someone, to encourage them, to alleviate fears and anxieties because you have found in Christ refuge from that fear and from that anxiety. It is as ideal right now to be a messenger for the kingdom of God as it is in the best of times. And in fact, I think that if you study history, you'll find that the more adverse the circumstances, the more effective the church often was. The more adverse the circumstances, the greater the trial. The more people let go, the more they were aware that this world and clinging to the things of the world and the rituals of the world and the, the incomes of the world and the ambitions of the world and the materialism of the world, it was all just so pointless in times of peace, we are tempted to fall in love with material things and, and become busy. But in times of hardship, we gain a certain perspective that may motivate us differently. So I'm asking you this morning, what can you do in your circle of influence to reach out, to reach across to still be plugged into other people's lives, to other people's experience, to bring the God of refuge that you've come to know into their sphere of influence, into their, to the comfort of their lives. The church of God is alive and well today because wherever the believers went, they took the church with them. They took their Savior with them into those uncharted territories. And where the head of the church is, the body of the church is also. You and I collectively and individually are members of the body of Christ. Whether we meet physically on a Sabbath morning or not is not the issue where you are in whatever group you meet in, whatever, whatever family unit, there the presence of God is. Whatever message you put on social media, whatever telephone call you make, wherever your words exhibit and display the influence of the kingdom, that's where the kingdom of God is. That's where the church of God is active and busy. The church is not the building. The church is not the pews. The church are not the assets the church is the people, the members of the body of Christ connected to the head. So where is the head directing you today? Where is the head driving you towards today? Are you still in tune with the head that you may play your part as a member of the body of Christ? Whether the circumstances are conducive or not conducive is irrelevant. It's often in the midst of that that we have our greatest opportunity because of the crisis at hand. So make God your refuge and your strength. Turn to him with your fears, your anxieties, your brokenness and your sin. Make sure that you are right with him in these uncertain times, of course. And then be a messenger of hope, an ambassador of the gospel to someone else around you. The mandate of the gospel commission has not changed. How we go about it, maybe. 
But the mandate has not changed. God is still on his throne. You are still his hands and his feet. You are still the heart of God in the community around you. You are still the called, the chosen, the blessed, and the active for the kingdom of God. So in this time, may we press together. In this time, may we not drift apart. In this time, may the word of God be more precious to us than ever before. May we have an, a spirit of peace and tranquility, a spirit of cooperation and service and looking out for others around us. Because that is the spirit of Jesus who laid down his life for those who didn't deserve it. No wonder that before Philippians 2 describes the humiliation of Jesus, leaving the throne of God, relinquishing his, his divine uh, prerogatives, becoming man. Right before that, there's this little one-liner that says, Therefore you... You and me, here's the deal. Look out not only for our own interests, but for the interests of others. How countercultural to what we're seeing happen in the stores today is the Christian spirit of being willing to give, to share, to be open handed instead of hoarding, pulling, and protecting. This is the call of the gospel to remember. To be the kingdom of God, the character of Jesus, the, the kindness, the face of Jesus to the community around us, even in these times. And I leave you to wrestle with God in terms of what that looks like for you personally. Trust in him, serve him, serve others. Look up, reach out, reach across, embrace, be the arms of God, the grace of God. Because crisis is also opportunity. The darker the times, the brighter the light of the gospel may shine through you. May God bless you in this. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness and your mercy. And at a time when we are fearful, at a time when we do not know, we feel like we've lost the predictability of another day ahead and everything seems to be up in the air, Lord, help us to press in towards you. I pray that, your, that you will provide for us an extra measure of your grace, that the promises of God will come alive to us in ways they haven't before, that the Spirit of God would just reassure us of our standing with you. And most of all, Lord Jesus, being able to forget about ourselves because we know we are secure in you, help us to think of others. Show us how you administer, Lord, as a church collectively, as individual members of your body. Show us how we would minister, how we would reach across, and how we would be effective for your kingdom. How the light of the gospel can shine in this time brighter than ever because of the crisis precisely. We thank you for your kindness, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today on our live stream. We will be here next week as well. Do stay tuned to our social media platforms, particularly the Whangarei Seventh-day Adventist uh, Facebook page. We'll be having communications there throughout the week. We'll be staying in touch. We'll be sharing spiritual things. And we will be making sure that uh, we're able to uh, keep you updated on any future developments of how we're going to do things. But right now, the plan is that we will do exactly the same thing next week. And we hope that you will tune in to that broadcast. I also want to refer you to Channel 27. On Freeview, Channel 204 on Sky, Hope Channel. It broadcasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And on the Sabbath and the Sunday, they will be aiming to have special broadcasts through this time when they know that churches are unable to operate in the traditional fashion. So there's going to be good things on there uh, and uh, that, that you can tune into above and beyond the live stream experience here. So God bless you. Keep yourself and your family safe and find someone to bless that's within your sphere of influence. God bless.